is a large stone cross. Large stone cross. Currently, it stands a little over 20 feet tall. It's in a church in Dumfriesshire, Scotland. It's in Dumfries, D-U-M-F-R-I-E-N, um, Scotland. But what survives of the cross is fragmentary. There's a piece missing right in here. Uh, we don't know how large the piece is. It's estimated that it's about that size on the basis of you know, the width down here and how it tapers to the width up here. Um, the cross was probably thrown down, that is, toppled and broken during the reign of Henry VIII during what's called the dissolution of the monastery, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later on. The reason this is important for the dream of the rood is because the cross has inscribed on it, ooh, that's horrible, uh, oops, the cross has inscribed on it, which you can barely make out because of the quality of our projector in screen has these runes right here inscribed up and down all four sides okay. and the runes are of the dream of the root now the portion of the dream of the root that's here may predate the actual poem the dream of the root that is this might be like a precursor to it, or the poem, The Dream of the Root, had already been composed, and whoever this Northumbrian carver was incorporated parts of it into this stone cross. The stone cross itself dates from right around, we think, 700 AD. So it's pretty early. Keep in mind, according to Cadman, according to um, B, Cadman doesn't write, compose, Cadman Tim, not write, compose, Cadman Tim until somewhere right around 681. Okay. Bede's writing his Ecclesiastical History in 731. So, if this dates from 700, it's really early. Alright? Um, and then you have these, these vine and scroll work images up and down all four sides also. You have images of, you know, for example, here Christ, and this is Mary Magdalene. Here you have a better image of the runes up and down the sides. Um, I'm trying to see if I can get any even clear one. More imagery of the scroll work and animals and such. You can even see the runes clearer here. Okay. Um, This is a couple of different images, several different images, of what's called the Old English Futhark, or Futhark sometimes, as it's given off to the right there. This is the runic writing that the Anglo-Saxons developed from the Germanic tribes. Okay? The ancient Germanic people, the earliest form of Germanic that we have, that survives in written form or inscribed form, let's say, is runic. A couple of um, sword blades have been found that have preserved, that have been preserved okay, over the years. Usually metal completely um, disintegrates. But a couple of sword blades, a um, lot of rocks, but the earliest inscription dates from right around 200, which is before a... Um, a bishop named Wulfala, a Gothic bishop, before he actually translates uh, the parts of the Old and New Testament into the Gothic language and does that using a Gothic alphabet, an alphabet that he creates based on Greek. This predates that. Okay? Gothic is the earliest surviving form of the Germanic languages that we have. Okay? 
But the runic alphabet predates even that. The runic alphabet itself probably, we're not 100% sure about this, probably comes from a group of North Italians called Etruscans. Okay? But it's called the food board because of the first six symbols. U, O, R, Okay? Food board. So these are the representations of these sounds. B looks pretty much like a real B. Etruscan probably got their form um, possibly from Phoenician, etc. Okay, but notice this, mm, what looks like an M, isn't an M. This is the M. That's an E sound. Okay? This is alphabetic. That is, it's representing sounds. Okay? This is what's inscribed on the Ruthwell cross or the Rivel cross. Rid of all that. Yes, that's the system. Return to the poem. We've got a little introduction, which I'm not really going to talk about. The poem itself, um, the long version, survives in that manuscript that I mentioned the other day, one of the great four. Old English um, poetic codices called the Vercelli Manuscript. Why? Because it's in the cathedral at Vercelli, Italy. And it has apparently been there since, um, if I remember correctly, about 1200. There was an English missionary group to Italy, even though Italy was already Christian. You know, it's like, you know, Pentecostals going out to Baptist territory and missionizing the uh, Baptists, etc. Okay? So it's in the Vercelli manuscript, and there's uh, several other works in the Vercelli manuscript, including some homilies and things like that. So the poem opens, uh, just a second, I did not see this. The poem opens with a traditional, somewhat traditional, beginning in Anglo-Saxon. What? H, W, Ash, T. Modern English, what? So it opens, what? Doesn't mean that the speaker doesn't have a clue what's going on or is asking what is going on. This is an old English form of catching the audience's attention. In present day society, if you're in a large group of people and you're eating and drinking, etc., how do you get everybody's attention? You can call out, hey, okay, which is kind of tacky. Or you can raise a glass and it doesn't work with bottles, <laughs> plastic bottles. Tinkle crystal, you know, because it's loud and it's piercing. Okay. You can clap your hands. Okay. This is kind of the old English, hey, which everybody then settles down. Because it's an indication of, I'm going to sing a song, or I'm going to recite something, or I have something important to tell you. So, Liuza translates this as, listen. Now, almost every translator translates it differently. You hear, you see, Listen, you see what, you see low. <laughs> There's even been one translator, because the same word opens Beowulf. There's even been one translator who translates it, yo! <laughs> okay. <laughs> Works. <laughs> Gets everybody's attention. You know, everybody down the hall heard that. <clears throat> I will speak of the sweetest dream what came to me in the middle of the night when speech bearers slept in their rest. Speech bearers. That's another one of those old English synonyms. Well, who are speech bearers? Who bears speech? Dogs, cats, crows, birds, chickens? No. 
us. So when speech bearers slept in their rest. Now, that is a literal translation that Lee is against that. The Old English word is rared, rared, barren. Rared, speech, barren, bearer. But translating that literally, does the meaning of it come across clearly? See, in the Old English, rare and barren would be clear. It would be absolutely clear to everybody listening to it. But to a modern English audience, speech bearer, it's a little more difficult. Okay? And this gets at one of the important issues when it comes to translating. How do you translate something? That is, if you're translating for yourself, you might translate differently than if you're translating for another group of people. If you're translating for another group of people, what is your goal? Is it to render what is in the original text faithfully to the original text? That is, is it to capture the letter of the text? Or do you want to capture the spirit of the text? Do you want to communicate the ideas? If not as close as possible, the actual words. Okay. This is what Bede was talking about when he said in, in conjunction of Cadman's hymn, this is the spirit of the text, but not the actual wording of the text. He was trying to convey the ideas, the meaning of it. Why? Because it's impossible to convey the exact ideas. All right? I usually suggest to, to graduate students, they try to do both. Try to get as literal as possible while at the same time conveying the message, the meaning. So I wouldn't suggest translating that rare bearing as speech bearers. Yes, that is the literal meaning, but it doesn't convey the message as clearly. So, he says he's going to speak of the sweetest dream, what came to him in the middle of the night. Okay. Notice, you know, we say today, you know, uh, what is it, uh, Fantine sings in Les Miserables, I dreamed a dream, okay, no, what does the speaker say here? It's not I dream, it's the dream came to me. Like the dream is out there somewhere and it latched on to the speaker. It seemed that I saw a most wondrous tree raised on high, circled around with light, the brightest of beams. Okay. Beam there doesn't mean beam of light. It means beam of wood. All that beacon was covered in gold. Jim stood fair at the earth's corners. Five there were upon, there were up on the crossbeam. All the angels of the Lord looked on. So what is the speaker telling us? Okay. It's the middle of the night and he has this dream. Okay. And what's the dream? He sees a big giant cross. How big is the cross? Look at what it says. Jim stood fair at the earth's corners. He's talking about the four points of the cross. He's lying on the ground, looking up at the sky. What does he see? At the back behind his head is the head of the cross. At his feet at the horizon is the foot of the cross. Off to the east and off to the west, or east, whichever, okay, are the arms of the cross. The cross encompasses the sky. Okay. The gems that he sees at the earth's corners probably, most people interpret it this way, probably are blood. 
And then there were five gems that stood on the cross beam. That is, you have a cross like this. So he sees gems here, 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 here. Why? Hand, 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 feet. Wounds of Christ. Okay? And five here. Why? Hand, head, and feet meet there. And then what else? Keep going. His heart. Keep going. What other wound? The spear wound in the side. Exactly. Okay. Those are the five wounds. So, all the angels of the Lord looked on. Fair through all eternity. That was no felon's gallows, but Holy Spirit beheld them there. Men over the earth and all this glorious creation. Notice the speaker says, who is observing the cross? Everything. All of creation. Okay? All the angels, we're told, men over all this earth, and all this glorious creation. That is, everything's attention, boom, focuses down on this one event. Wondrous was the victory tree. The old English words there are theabam or I'm going to check, check in just a minute. Wondrous. Yeah, theabam. Okay. There's another time where say a trail is used. Thea means victory. We've already seen beam, tree, or literal. Beam, if you want to translate that. Right? But again, beam is a little too ambiguous because it means here tree. It's a victory tree, though. How do most people look? Well, let me rephrase that. What was the cross for Roman culture and civilization? Instrument of torture and ultimately death. Okay, what kind of instrument in to of torture and death? The worst. It was the worst. It was reserved for the worst criminals. Okay, it wasn't. You know, you go and rob the five and dime store. You're going to get hung on a cross. That's not what happened. All right. So the cross is this horrible form of torture and death. And what does our speaker say? It's a sign of victory. It's a victory tree. Okay? He's already changing somewhat this mentality towards the cross. So, wondrous was the victory tree, and I was fouled by sins. Notice that juxtaposition. The tree is wondrous. That is, it is awful. Full of awe. All right? And I, not wondrous, not full of awe, was fouled by sins. The old English um, thing there, fouled by sins, isn't actually fouled. I don't know why he translated it that way. You're going to see, I love bringing in the actual old English. It's sinu. Fa. This word fa means ornamented or adorned. The victory tree was wondrous, and I was adorned in sin, clothed in sin. Okay? I have no idea. Other than that, he's saying, I mean, news is translating it and saying, well, but he's all covered in sin. Therefore, if you're covered in sin, you're foul. You're dirty. He could have just as easily been translated that as dirtied in sin. But that's not what it means. Fa means covered. Notice, covered is neutral. Fouled is not neutral. Fouled has a negative connotation to it. Okay? 
So, incense. Yeah. Incense. Wounded with guilt, I saw the tree of glory. Again, notice these juxtapositions. The tree of glory, which obviously is not wounded with guilt, but I am wounded with guilt. Now that one he does translate correctly. For wounded midwoman is what it um, reads. I saw the tree of glory honored in garments, shining with joys, bedecked with gold. See, this is why I think this word is so important. It's honored. It's adorned. It's decked with. But the speaker is honored and adorned and decked with the tree, however, is honored, shining, and bedecked in garments, joys, and gold. Again, the speaker is showing the distinction between himself and the cross. Gems had covered worthily the Creator's tree, and yet beneath that gold I began to see an ancient, wretched struggle. What does he mean? Beneath that gold. Right. He's saying, as I looked, he could perceive, he could understand, or he could see more clearly. What? That this image that he's seeing has more than It's almost as if he is suggesting this image that he sees of the cross shimmers. Like a, you know, you get one of those little holographic cards and you turn it. And depending on what your perspective is, looking at it, it's one image. You turn it slightly, it's another image. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that in just a minute. That's what I'm heading to, okay? No, don't, don't be sorry. He sees, as it were, on one level. Okay. It's a cross. It's a tree. It's covered with gems. But then what does he perceive? He looks more closely. Or it's, it's like, you know, one of those mosaics you'll see on a computer. You'll see on some website. It's a mosaic. It's an image. And you zoom in and look closer and closer and closer. And the mosaic is of multiple images. And each one of the images is different. And yet you put it all together and it makes something else. He is seeing more clearly now what the tree is. And he says, beneath the gold, that is, underneath the honor, the glory, the adornment, <coughs> I began to see an ancient, wretched struggle. For it first began to bleed on the right side. That is, the cross begins to bleed on the right side. Okay? Do crosses bleed in and of their own? Go cut some wood, make a cross, and go, bleed! <laughs> it doesn't bleed, you know. Just won't. I was all beset with sorrows, fearful for that fair vision. In other words, when he sees this cross start to bleed, he's kind of like, okay, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. This is different. He's used to seeing a cross gold adorned. Why? Because the speaker would see one every time he went into church. Every time. There would be a large processional crucifix okay, or cross. The difference between a crucifix and a cross is a cross is just a cross. Crucifix has an image of Christ on it. All right? He would see a large processional cross that would be used in the services. So that's something he would naturally see. But when he sees it start to bleed, and he sees that beneath the gold there's a struggle going on, it starts to trouble him, he says. I was beset with sorrows, fearful for that fair vision. I saw that eager beacon change garments and colors. It changed garments. That is, at one moment he sees it covered with gems and gold, and another moment 
Not gems and gold it's covered with. It's blood, sweat. Now it was drenched, stained with blood. Now bedecked with treasure. Well, what does he really mean, though? The blood is the treasure. The blood is the gold. The gold is the blood. That's what makes the cross adorned with glory. Okay? And yet lying there a long while, I beheld in sorrow the Savior's tree. The Savior's tree. Until I heard it utter a sound. The best of woods began to speak words. The tree actually speaks. Okay? This is an example of what's called prosopopoeia. Okay? When an inanimate object speaks. There's a... Um, there are a couple of other Old English poems where you have this. One is called um, The Husband's Message, where a piece of wood speaks. It has an inscription on it, and the inscription literally speaks to the bearer. Okay? <coughs> this is an, an old technique. It's not peculiar to Anglo-Saxon. It exists in Roman literature. It exists in Greek literature. It includes, goes all the way up to the 20th century. Tolkien does it a lot, okay, in some of his writings. So, he's lying there. It's the middle of the night. Most of the rare barons are asleep, but this guy can't sleep or is asleep and has this vision because later on it's not going to be clear that he was actually sleeping. It could be that he was an insomniac and he's lying awake and boom, he has this vision. And the tree speaks. It was so long ago, I remember it still. Now, how long ago was it? Oh, we don't know exactly, because we don't know when the poem was composed, or when the speaker is having this vision. But it's probably at least about 600 years. I remember it still. I was felled from the forest edge, ripped up from my roots. The tree remembers the day it was cut down. Strong enemy seized me there, made me their spectacle, made me bear their criminals. Their criminals. The implication is that Christ is not the first person to have been crucified on this tree. They bore me on the shoulders and set me on a hill, Golgotha. Enemies enough fixed me fast. Then I saw the Lord of mankind. Then I saw the Lord of mankind hasten eagerly when he wanted to ascend onto me. Notice the portrayal of Christ here. He hastened. He's like, come on, let's get it going. I want to do this. All right? Because he wanted to ascend onto me. Notice the multiple meanings of that word ascend. Ascend can, can mean he wanted to climb up onto me, and what else can it mean? He wanted to ascend onto me. Okay. What does Christ say? Unless the Son of Man be lifted up, you know, you're, you're dead in your sin. There I dared not bow down or break against the Lord's word. Why does the cross say, I dared not bow down or break. What is it suggesting? Exactly. It wants to. It wants to bow down or break. It doesn't want to be the form of torment for, as he calls it, the Lord of mankind. Lord of mankind. Trans Okay. Trans means Lord. 
one of the means, one of the words that may be added. No. He says, I dare not do it. Why? Because it would be against the Lord's word. Remember that fourfold Germanic ethic that I had up on the board a couple days ago? What was the first element of that? Duty to one's Lord. Well, what does that mean, duty to one's Lord? Your Lord gives you an order, you follow it. Against the Lord's word. I dare not bow down or break against the Lord's word. In other words, the Lord's word was, you have to do this. But I don't want to. <laughs> because what is the cross ordered to do? Kill me. Uh, not me. No. When I saw the ends of the earth tremble. The cross is saying, I saw the world shake at the coming of the Lord. I wanted to <clears throat> fall down shake too. But the Lord said no. Easily I might have felled all those enemies and yet I stood fast. That's kind of an interesting line because of the imagery that it creates. How would a frog fell its enemies? I mean, Peter Jackson would just go bananas with this. Because what would it mean? Or, or um, George Lucas in the one Star Wars film with Yoda and Count Duke. Because it means the cross doing some kind of jujitsu on all these Roman soldiers around it. Of its own volition. Not somebody wielding the cross, you know, not a Schwarzenegger in there swinging the cross like a club, but the cross on its own, whacking guys on the head, you know, knocking them out and such. No. Then the young hero made ready. He says, da, 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 da. Then the young hero made ready. That was God Almighty, strong and resolute. He ascended on the high gallows. The Old English. Angiri de hina fa, that's preliminary stuff. Young hale. Hale. Hero. Warrior. Fighter. Okay. The young hero, warrior, fighter. How is Christ normally presented. Is he a warrior? No. He's what? He's Isaiah 53's suffering servant. He's a lamb led to slaughter. Do lambs being led to slaughter suddenly hop up on their back hooves, you know, and try to fight those that are slaughtered? No. So why portray Christ as a young warrior? This is one of the interesting things about the game of the ring. It is a very Germanic portrayal of a leader. Now keep in mind, Christ is a leader of his own group of retainers, the apostles. Right? In Germanic fashion, if you're going to be a leader, you have to be heroic. You have to be a warrior. You have to lead your men into battle. You can't just sit back and let other people beat the snot out of you, in other words. Okay? So, he says, I saw the young hero made ready. The young hero had it. And then we get the second half of the line. That was God Almighty. That was God Almighty. So, the speaker immediately links. He says, young Caleb, and then God al Mickey. Young hero, God Almighty. Now, everybody can understand a young hero. Not everybody can understand God Almighty. Okay. What is he doing? This young hero was the eternal God. Right? And he does that in the exact same line. You're going, we're going to see he's going to do this repeatedly. 
I think he's doing it for a reason, which I'll talk about in a moment. The young hero made ready, that was God Almighty, strong and resolute. What does resolute mean? Determined. His mind is made up. Right? He ascended on the high gallows, brave in the sight of many. Notice, he ascended. What's the agency? Who's doing the action? Christ. It's not an action being performed on him. It's not he is being raised on the gallows. Okay? Why? Because a good hero acts himself. He doesn't wait for others to act upon him. Brave in the sight of many, when he wanted to ransom mankind. Notice what the hero is doing. In ascending the cross, the hero is saving everybody else. Now, that's a good hero. That's a good portrayal of a Germanic hero. Someone who will fight for his people. His people happen to be all mankind. I trembled when he embraced me, but I dared not bow to the ground. Notice again, he embraced what do we think of when we think of the word embrace? Like you embrace your lover. It's, is it just? Oh. <laughs> no, it's it's a deep, powerful hug. That's what Christ does for the cross. But I dared not bow to the ground or fall to the earth's corners. I had to stand fast. I was reared as a cross. Reared, meaning raised up. I raised up the mighty king. Now, this is just going to be like this passage. The mighty king, who? The Lord of heaven. Now, everybody in the audience can understand a mighty king because they were familiar with kings and chieftains. Lord of heaven? That's a harder concept to buy, especially if you are... Um, Descended from the Germans. And, big speculation here, and if either you're not yet Christian, or you're kind of Christian. You're on your way, you've, you've been told the stories, and you, you're kind of interested, but you're not all the way there. Okay? Because in the Germanic pantheon, or in the Germanic mythology, there is no one all powerful God. You know, Odin Allfather is not more powerful than the fates. The fates are kind of behind Odin. Odin can't do anything about the fates. Just like in the Greek system. You have all the gods, whether you're talking the Olympic gods or the Titans, etc. Doesn't matter. The fates are behind them. So, they are as bound by fate, essentially, as humans are. Okay? So, I raised up the mighty king, the Lord of heaven. I dared not lie down. They drove dark nails through me. Well, yeah, but through who first? Christ. The scars are still visible. The point? Open wounds of hate. I dare not harm any of them. They mock us both together. Notice what the cross does with that line. Actually, with that line and the line before. They drove dark nails through me. What's the cross say? I suffered too. It wasn't just cross. It wasn't just Christ. I suffered. When he was nailed to me, notice, he had to be nailed to something. That pain I endured. And then he says, they mock us both together. The cross is identifying with Christ. I was all drenched with blood. Yeah, not its own, but 
covered what? By Christ's blood. Flowing from that man's side after he had sent forth his spirit. It was finished. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Oh, and he died. Much have I endured on that hill of hostile fates. I saw the God of hosts cruelly stretched out. Now, think about that for a moment. The God of hosts. That's a paraphrase of the Old Testament. The Lord of hosts. I saw the God of hosts stretched out. Well, how can the God of hosts be stretched out? Because the God of hosts is spirit. Here's one of the central points of the poem. God became man. Period. That is, God, the eternal Lord, the maker of the universe, the whole nine yards, entered human history, took on human flesh, and died as a man. This, I think, is one of the points the speaker is trying to get across. That Christ was two things. Fully God, fully man. Right? In other words, the poem is attempting to communicate a very important theological truth. A theological truth that in the first 300 years of the Christian church, you know, got hammered out and argued back and forth. And eventually proclaimed in what's called the first ecumenical council, which is the Council of Nicaea in 325. I'm going to relate this to that bishop I mentioned earlier, Utrecht, in 325. The first ecumenical council in 325 was called together by Constantine of Byzantium, Constantinople, for one purpose, ultimately. And the one purpose was to declare Arius, an Alexandrian priest, a priest from Alexandria, Egypt, a heretic. That is, common to popular, where it is in popular belief, common to popular belief, the Council of Nicaea was not called together to have a vote as to what was the correct belief. It was determined before the council even met. Arius, Arius is a heretic. And here's why. And this is why it's important for this poem. Arius believed that Christ, or Jesus, um, was not the same as God. Arius said there is God the Father okay, and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. But there's a little bit of difference between this and these two. Because he said this, God the Holy God the Son, had a time when he was not. In other words, there was a moment in time, however you think of time when you're thinking that there was a moment in time when this person of the Godhead did not exist. And he used as proof of that, you know, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee from the Psalms. That this day is metaphor because back then there was no time. So that there is a point when God the Son did not exist, and then there's a point, the next moment, God the Son does exist. So he said, Christ isn't fully God. Now, the council was called to say, wrong, that's heresy. That's completely wrong. Because what the council affirmed, what the council said, was that Christ is fully God, fully man. But, un mixed. That is, there, you know, you can't take Christ's flesh 
examine it like a scientist would and say, oh, here's the God particle and here's the human particle. Okay. They are both together, God, man, etc. Okay. Fully God, fully man, of the same essence, they use this term. Homoousmic, that is, one essence. The reason I said I make sure I get it right is because if you throw an I right there, homoousmius, it, be, it means of, it means one of similar essence. This is about what this can be determined. So, of the same essence. Why is this important? Because that bishop that I mentioned earlier, Ufala or Wulfalus, Ufala or Wulfalus, he goes by the same name, who was a Gothic bishop, okay, he was a follower of Arius. Okay. Gothic Christianity did have, we know, did have some influence on British Christianity. That is, there were some Aryan Christians in the period before the coming of St. Augustine in 597. So there is this element of Aryan Christianity in what we would call England. And then Augustine comes and he brings Catholic Christianity, Roman Catholic, I should say, Christianity, which is fully in line with this. All right? And I think what's happening, what we're seeing here in this poem, is that the composer of the poem, who I think has got to be a priest, just has to be, is attempting to kind of push, let's say, a particular theological viewpoint. This one. He's attempting to change minds. How? Not. What works better in trying to get a point across? The story? The plain old prose. Plain old, this is the meaning of the message. The story. Why does Christ tell so many stupid stories? So many stories or parables. Okay? So, he says, I saw the God of hosts cruelly stretched out. Darkness had covered with its clouds the ruler's corpse. How can the God of hosts have a corpse? That is, how can the God of hosts be dead? Well, because of this. Fully God, fully man. That shining radiance, shadows spread, gray under the clouds, all creation wept, mourned the king's fall. And these are some of the lines that are on the, the rubble cross. And the thematic center point of the whole poem is this next half line. Christ was on Roda. Christ was on the cross. Notice, all creation is weeping, is moving towards that. And then you get that little short half sentence, half line. Christ was on the cross. So, the first half of the poem kind of builds towards that. And the second half flows from it. And yet from afar men came hastening to that noble one. Yet from afar. That from afar doesn't only mean geographical distance. It does mean geographical distance. It also means time distance. Because here we are, let's say this poem is written 730 AD. What? 730 A.D. Men are still hastening to the cross. You know, every year at Christmas time, you'll see, you know, billboards or Christmas cards, you know, wise men still seek him, kind of a thing. That's what the poet is speaking about. Right? Men from afar came hastening. I watched it all. I was beset with sorrow. Yet I sank into their hands, humbly, 
eagerly, that is, they're taking the body down. Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, probably John the Beloved, the apostle, or the disciple, etc. There they took, now, think of these lines for a moment. There they took Almighty God, lifted him from his heavy torment. How's that for paradox? Almighty God, they lifted up and took him from his heavy torment. How almighty is he? Because almighty kind of implies what? All mighty. Having all power. All strength. And yet, he can't lift himself. He can't move. Why not? Because he's dead. <laughs> And he's not like, you know, uh, what's his name? You know, Wesley in Princess Bride. He's not mostly dead. <laughs> he doesn't need a miracle max to shove a pill down his throat. Okay? They took Almighty God and lifted him from his heavy torment. The warriors then left me. Notice how Christ's disciples are depicted. Warriors. They left me standing, drenched in blood, shot through with arrows. They laid him down, bone-weary, and stood by his body's head. How bone-weary was he? Lifeless. That's how bone-weary. And stood by his body's head. They watched the Lord of Heaven there, who rested a while. That's lithotes. That's severe understatement. How did he rest? Well, like when you find somebody who's sleeping and you lift up their arm and they just go like that, okay? Except they're still breathing. He wasn't breathing. He wasn't mostly dead. Okay? He rested a while weary from his mighty battle. Again, that martial imagery. They began to build a tomb for him in the sight of his slayer. That is, they built a tomb, they dug a tomb in the sight of the cross. There's a tradition in the church that on Golgotha, was the cave, okay, or the tomb unused before, that Joseph of Arimathea put Christ into, which is today where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is in Jerusalem. Uh, they carved it from bright stone, set within the Lord of Victories. And the audience, depending on who the audience is, I think, you know, some people in the audience have got to be scratching their head. How can he be the Lord of victories when he's dead? Okay. This is the paradox. I think the, the composer wants the audience to consider. That is, truth isn't necessarily one plus one equals two. Truth sometimes can only be apprehended in a mystical fashion. So, and they began to sing a dirge for him. Wretched at evening when they wished to travel hence, weird from the glorious Lord, he rested there with little company. Notice they wished to travel hence before the evening, and so he rested there with a little company. How little? By himself. Rested means he was at rest. Doesn't mean he's snoring. And as we stood there, we who? The crosses, because it's not just one cross. There are two, uh, two others. Man, I put my hands where I can't use them. Weeping a long while, fixed in our station, the song ascended from those warriors. Typical Germanic fashion. When the Lord died, those that survived raised a burial mound over him, and then they circled the mound singing a death song. We'll see it when we get to the end of Beowulf. You'll see it if you've read The Lord of the Rings, okay, in the book The Two Towers, or in the film version it's even included. The corpse grew cold, the fair life house. That's what tells you he's really dead. Then they began to fell us all to the earth, a terrible fate. They dug for us a deep pit, yet the Lord's saints, friends, found me there, adorned me with gold and silver. Well, who are the Lord's Thanes, his friends, that found the cross 
in the pit. His, the guy who's, who called together the Council of Nicaea, St. Constantine, his mother, St. Helena. Right? I'm trying to remember the year this was supposed to be. Right around 312, 315. Um, St. Helena, if I remember correctly, St. Helena had a vision of where the cross was. Okay? And she and a few others went to Jerusalem and they dug and they recovered the cross of Christ and the other two. Um, this event is celebrated two days in the church calendar. I think it's in the Catholic calendar. It's definitely in the Orthodox church calendar. And the two days are, and this has, could be another reason behind the writing of this song, are September 14th, which is, Feast day, I'm trying to remember the exact title. The feast day of the elevation of the most holy, precious, life giving cross of Christ. Big long title. And then the third, I believe, Sunday of Lent is to the exaltation of the holy, precious, and life giving cross. The first one, the elevation of the cross, September 14th, this is the day that the actual finding of the cross is commemorated. And the elevation, okay, the reason that term is used, is because in the, the church tradition, they knew it was the real cross. When the cross was raised, and people who were ill or sick or maimed came under the shadow of the cross and were immediately healed. In other words, they tried it with other crosses before. No effect. All right? Those are the friends and saying, St. Helena and her companions, that the cross is speaking about. Okay, now notice what the cross does. Turns from history. Oops, just a second. Turns from history and does what? Turns to math. In other words, he's been giving history lessons process. The first part of the poem, the speaker says, I dreamed a dream, blah, 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 blah. And then the cross spoke to me. Big, long passage about the cross speaking. And now the cross is still speaking, but the cross is giving the speaker a charge. Okay? Question in the back? What year did you say that was? That the cross was discovered? I'm thinking it's sometime around 312, 315. I'll, I'll double check that and give that to you. So, the cross now addresses the dreamer specifically. Now you can hear, my dear hero, that I have endured the work of evildoers, harsh sorrows. Now the time has come that far and wide they honor me. They who? the work of evildoers. Because what is all humanity in God's eyes? Evildoers. Men over the earth and all this glorious creation and pray to his son. The cross is saying, now I am honored among all the earth. Why? Because people pray to me. People, you know, I've got one on somewhere on my, you know, you know People wear these things. So he says, On me, the Son of God, suffered for a time. And so, glorious now, I rise up under the heavens. Because he suffered on me, the speaker is saying, the cross is saying, I now gloriously rise up. 
What is a little implication of that passage? It goes back to when he says, Christ, Christ was nailed on me. We both suffered. We were both mocked. Well, part of it is, if you want to be a follower of me, what? Take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. If you have that in mind, what will then happen? One will rise up unto the heavens. In other words, if one becomes like the cross, one will also rise up to the heavens. And he says, I am able what? To heal each of those who is in awe of me. It wasn't an accident that the first Christians used the cross as a symbol to identify each other to each other. Once I was made into the worst of torments, most hateful to all people. You know how crosses kill? How you die when you're crucified? Suffocation. You know, you'll see images of, of crucifixions and stuff, and nine times out of ten, they're wrong. Because what they show, for example, crucifixions of Christ will sometimes show him, you know, with his legs crossed like this, but he's on a little pedestal. Not how it works. The way it works is, yeah, you get the nails through your hands, but then your hands are also tied. Because if you drive nails through your hands, and you get nailed onto a cross, and then the cross gets lifted up, because your nails lying down, and then the cross gets lifted up into the hole that it sits in, what happens when the cross gets lifted up like this? It falls down about three feet. And that's how deep the hole would need to be in order to keep the cross up there. Well, when it falls down about three feet, what would happen to your wrist? It'd rip right through. That's why you're also tied. Well, but then what happens when the cross comes in and goes down like that? Your shoulders dislocate. And when your shoulders are dislocated, and you're hanging like this, what can't you do? That's all you can little tiny breaths. That's why it can take 24 hours to die. The reason, you know, um, the reason the Jews go and ask, you know, can you break their legs? <laughs> because you can't have people hanging on the cross, especially on the Passover. All right? They wanted to make sure they were dead to take them down. Christ had already died. The other two weren't dead yet. The breaking of the legs is just the final shock that's needed to kill them. So, once I was made into the worst of torments, before I opened the true way of life for speech bearers. Opened the true way of life. Multiple meanings there, like ripped open the side, okay, opened the way to heaven. Lo, the king of glory, guardian of heaven's kingdom, honored me over all the trees of the forest, just as he also, almighty God, honored his mother, Mary herself, above all womankind for the sake of all men. Okay. That council of Nicaea? Yeah. The job description, did that have anything to do with it? Because I remember hearing that story when I was younger. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's symbolism with the dog. Um, the tree that honored my grandmother. Yeah, it's nobody knows if this was a dogwood tree. Many say that it wasn't because dogwoods, if I remember right, aren't native to Palestine. But when does the dogwood bloom? Early in spring. It's usually right around when Easter falls. It's March or April. Okay. What characterizes the dogwood? That is, what's unique kind of about a dogwood? Well, you've got, if I remember correctly, four petals. And what, hap what shows up on each petal? You've got a little mark here, 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 and here. Just as the cross depicts. Okay? The gem. It, you know, this kind of symbolism, I mean, it's rife in the church. Just like um, 
How many of you have read the Harry Potter stories? Good. Uh, <laughs> why does Harry have a holly and phoenix wand? Why holly? Holly bush? One of my favorite pubs in London, by the way. Um, why a holly bush? What does holly have? First of all, what kind of plant is holly? It's an evergreen. Okay. What does that mean? It means it is evergreen. <laughs> what does that mean? It's always alive. It doesn't go dormant. It doesn't shed its leaves. Okay. What about an evergreen's leaves? We're going to get by. <laughs> it, it relates. What about an evergreen, a uh, holly tree's leaves? You know, do you do you rake them up and go jump in them? No. Uh, not unless you're, you know, sadist or something. <laughs> they have thorns. Okay. So the leaves have thorns. What else does the bush or tree have? Red berries. Okay. Red berries. How many of you are familiar with the Christmas carol? Holly and the ivy. Okay. Why the holly? Because the holly is always living. It's got prickly thorns and it has red berries. Christ is always living. Yes, he died physically, corpse, you know, the whole nine yards. Okay. But even while dead, his spirit was alive because according to the church, what happened? He went down into hell. Not because he was sent there, but because he went a-knocking. Okay? Thorns represent the crown of thorns. Red berries represent the blood. That's what we call it. <laughs> the phoenix. The phoenix is a symbol of resurrection. It, it was used in the Middle Ages often by the church. In fact, if you go to Holy Trinity Church... Anglican Church in Stratford upon Avon today, where Shakespeare is buried, or at least this is true in 2002, the last time I was there. And you go into the church and you look at all the pretty architecture and everything, and you forget all that. And you go up to an altar. On the altar is this big, beautiful tapestry. And right smack dab in the middle of that tapestry is a phoenix. Why? Because the phoenix dies and is resurrected. And people want to say J.K. Rowling is trying to lead children to hell and Satan. Idiots. <laughs> Absolute nonsense. Sorry if you're one of those. I'm not really, but I'm just saying that. Um, so, back to where he says, you know, talks about, you know, I'm the true way of life and everything, how he honored me over all the trees of the wood, just as he's also honored his mother. Well, if you, if you go to the Council of Constantinople and you look at the creed, or excuse me, Council of Nicaea, and you look at the creed that the council wrote, okay, the 318 bishops that attended this, they wrote, it's the first part of what is called the Nicene Creed. Because the Nicene Creed that we know today is actually the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. Okay? It's a mixture of the creed written in 325 and 381. Because the first part of the creed goes, I, I, I say it every day and I can never remember what I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, uh, creator of all things, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Virgin Mary. Okay? Right there. What has he just done? He's talked about all of the God the Father same as the Son, etc., etc., and he's exalted Mary. 
Well, what does Mary say in, what is it? Luke chapter 2 or 1. The Magnificat. When she goes and visits her cousin Elizabeth, and Elizabeth says, who am I that I should meet the mother of my Lord? And Mary launches off into this, you know, blessed am I among all women, etc. What is she talking about here? Now, I bid you. Bid. Command. That's what that word means. Bid doesn't mean I ask you, please, nicely, will you do this for me? Okay? I bid you, my beloved hero, that you reveal this vision to men. In other words, tell everybody about this. Tell them in words that it is the tree of glory on which Almighty God suffered for mankind's many sins and Adam's ancient deeds. Death he tasted there. Notice, tasted, not consumed by. Death he tasted there, yet the Lord rose again with his great might to help mankind. Now, the Germanic audience, or a quasi-Germanic audience, or a quasi-Christian audience would hear that, and they would go, totally awesome. Here's a Germanic hero who can die leading his thanes into battle, yet not be conquered by death. Overcomes death. No Germanic hero does that. Siegfried doesn't do it. Beowulf doesn't do it. The gods don't do it. Because in the Germanic mythology, at the end, Ragnarok, they're gone. He's not gone. That's the point. Death he tasted there, yet the Lord rose again with his great might to help mankind. He ascended into heaven. It's the Nicene Creed. He will come again to this middle earth to seek mankind on doomsday. He whom, almighty God, the Lord himself, and his angels with him. And he will judge. He has the power of judgment. Each one of them as they have earned beforehand in this, Leusa translates loaned life. It's that same word we saw in the Wanderer. This lana life. This lean life. It's not only loan. Because what's the real implication? Think of what lean is compared to its opposite. Think meat. Lean meat is not fat meat. Okay? And I know our society says, oh, you shouldn't eat fat meat and everything. Maybe. Fat is good for you. Animal fat is good for you. Your red blood cells need it for what? Protein. Okay? What he's saying is our lives here are lean. They're thin. Compared to life in heaven, where we'll all be, I'm not, I'm, I don't mean this literally, we'll all be nice, fat, plump, and juicy. In other words, lana as opposed to healthy. All right? You know, back to kind of this kind of, this kind of. If you're familiar with the Christmas carol, here we go, a wassailing. Among the leaves so green, etc., etc. That word, wassail, wassail. Now we say, oh, well, that's a drink. Yeah, kind of. But it comes from the old English, was hell, which means be whole. So when you go a wassailing, you are going to people and telling them, be whole. Be well. Be complete. Okay? So, he goes on. He comes with his angels to judge each person. No one there may be unafraid at the words which the ruler will speak. He will ask before the multitude where the man might be who for the Lord's name would taste bitter death as he did earlier on that tree. In other words, who took up this cross? That's what that means. He's going to ask, who took up his cross? Who denied himself? The speaker here, and even Christ in the New Testament, doesn't mean everyone has to be physically crucified. 
You know, St. Peter was physically crucified. How? Upside down. Okay. Christians under Nero were, were often physically crucified and then lit on fire. I mean, he had his palace grounds opened up and he had the roads lined with Christian torches. He was a really <laughs> nice piece of work. Okay? But they will tremble then and little think what they might even begin to say to Christ. But no one there need be very afraid. Notice, you don't have to worry about the last judgment if you've borne in your breast the best of deacons. Now, and I think he probably there literally means if you've worn a cross. I don't know. Does that mean, you know, like I read a thing the other day about some rapper driving a gold-plated limo, <laughs> got shot at and wrecked the car, and he comes out and he's, you know, covered with these, all this bling, and they're all crosses. Does that mean? Probably not. Okay? I think he does mean it literally, but also metaphorically. But through the cross, what? Shall seek the kingdom. Every soul from this earthly way, whoever thinks to rest with the Lord. In other words, it's not enough to just to wear the thing, but you have to kind of have faith in it. Then, notice, I raise to the tree of life. So, the speaker has this dream, or the speaker has this vision. It's not clear that the speaker was sleeping. Or that the dreamer was was sleeping. <coughs> he dreams the vision. He sees the tree. The tree speaks to him. The tree then charges him, go tell others about the dream. And then the tree stops speaking, and we're back to just the dreamer. I prayed to the tree with a happy heart. Eagerly there while I was alone with little company. Compare that with the opening of the poem. I'm all alone, middle of the night, Speech bearers are asleep. The implication at the beginning of the poem is that the speaker is in isolation and feels separated from everybody else. Now, the speaker feels warm and fuzzy and all good inside. My spirit longed to start the journey forth. What journey forth? The speaking. To fulfill the charge. It has felt so much of longing, but also what other journey forth? Kind of like the seafarer's journey. The journey to heaven that the cross has been talking about. It is now my life's hope that I may seek the tree of mercy, excuse me, the tree of victory, alone more often than all men, and honor it well. I wish for that with all my heart. My hope of protection is fixed on the cross. In other words, the speaker now fully trusts in the hope proffered by the cross. The implication, that, the implication is that when the dream began, this wasn't the case. The speaker was troubled. How do we know? Because he sees the cross, and what's he thinking of? I'm all adorned, bedecked, shining, clothed in what? Sin. Yet, what happens as a result of the vision? speaker or the dreamer is freed from that guilt. How? Somebody else bore the sins. Christ the cross. I have few wealthy friends on earth. They've all gone forth. Kind of sound like the wanderer. Fled from worldly joys and sought the king of glory. They, know, they live now in heaven with the high father. Yeah, that is the same kind of language as with Odin, all father, right? And dwell in glory. Each day I look forward to the time when the cross of the Lord, on which I've looked while on this earth, will fetch me from this lone life again and bring me where there is great bliss, joy in heaven. Where what? The Lord's host is seated at the feast with ceaseless bliss. Heaven is depicted as that language we saw in Cadman, the Yeber Shippah. It's the wedding feast of the Lamb. Okay? And he goes on and talks about, May the Lord be my friend, he who on earth once suffered on the hanging tree for human sin, ransomed us, gave us life. What does he do? What does Christ do? Hope was renewed with cheer and bliss, 
for those who were burning there. Where? In hell. Why? Because Christ harrowed hell. The early teaching of the church is that during the three days in the tomb, Christ went down, knocked on the gates of hell, and asked, anybody who wanted to, follow me. In fact, according to the writings of many of the church fathers, when Christ harrowed hell, he destroyed the gates of hell. That's why he tells Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Right? According to the writings of many of the church fathers, what that means is he goes down to hell and bursts the gates of hell wide open so that anybody who is in hell is there of their own choosing. It's like being in a state pen with no gates, <laughs> no doors, and no bars. The only ones who are there are those who want to be in it. Okay? Um, so he came from hell with a multitude back into God's kingdom. Angels were rejoicing, etc., etc. When Almighty God, their ruler, returned to his rightful home. Notice at the very last thing, 10th century. Why? Because here I've been talking about the poem may date from as early as about 700. Here's why. That Vercelli manuscript, in fact, all four of those old English poetic, what are called codices, right, because they're manuscripts, all four of them date from right around 1000 AD. The poem is clearly not 1000 AD. The poem is clearly earlier than that, for the simple reason that part of it is on the Ribble Cross, and we know the Ribble Cross dates from... 700 to 725. Okay? All right, we'll stop there.